You know, uh, when most people think of the discovery of gold in, in North America, they think of the gold rush in California. What's the year? 1849, right. But the first big discovery of gold wasn't in California, it was in, it was in North Carolina, 1799, 50 years before. A 12-year-old boy named Conrad Reed was playing hooky from church. I hope none of us do that. He went fishing on his father's farm, and there he spotted an interesting black rock in the creek. So he lugged the rock home, 17 pounds of it, which, because of its uh, heavy weight, the family used it for a doorstop. Three and a half years. They had no idea that he had found a solid nugget of gold. In 1802, the Reeds sold the rock to an eagle-eyed, unscrupulous jeweler for $3.50. Of course, the gold was worth several thousand times that. And how sad the family must have been when they discovered that they'd had a gold and they were using it for, for a, a doorstop. They'd been tripping over it for three years. What a treasure. Many today are sadly tripping over a precious jewel unaware that riches unknown are found in that jewel. The Bible is just rich treasure. Uh, it's such a rich treasure. For inside of its covers is discovered the pearl of great price. Jesus talked about that in a parable. The cornerstone that the builders rejected, the pearl of great price. The four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they tell the story. And what a story it is. They are a, a sketch of the life of Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I say sketched because these are not biographies of Jesus. A biography would surely have had a lot of things about the early part of his life. We have very little um, for the first 30 years. So, uh, practically nothing, I would say. That's because the gospel writers did not write with biographical intent. They were concerned rather to communicate to their readers the revealing of Christ's miracle birth, his works, his teachings, his death, resurrection, and ascension to heaven where he is now our high priest. Matthew depicts Jesus as the rightful king, heir to David's throne. Mark emphasizes the mighty deeds and the wonderful acts of Jesus to, in, his, uh, in his great compassion for people. Luke presents Jesus as a friend of sinners, of the poor, and of the, of the crushed ones. And John, more than any other of the Gospels, portrays Jesus as being the divine Son of God. For truly he is. John wrote in order that we might believe. I'd like to have us turn to John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. John 20, verses 30 and 31. John 20. I see the pages rustling. That's good. Verse 30 says, And many other signs did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. That's the reason. Not only for the book of John, for the rest of the Bible as well. That's why these things are written and preserved for us. The, the divine Son of God, the God of creation, uh, I want to enumerate some of the principal events of the, of, of the life of Christ. He was born of a virgin, Isaiah 7, verse 14. That's an important idea. It was a miracle birth. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, Matthew chapter 1. Christ, while, while still an infant, Joseph and Mary fled to Egypt from the wrath of Herod the king. And when they returned, they settled in a little town called Nazareth, 
where Joseph was a carpenter. And Jesus himself was known as the carpenter's son. <laughs> they thought that he probably wouldn't amount to much, right? But at age 12, he went and visited down at the temple in Jerusalem. And the religious leaders were astounded at his understanding and the questions that he asked, so full of instruction that his mother had given to him. He was raised on the Bible, which he had authored himself. The whole book is a book about Jesus, right? From then on, Luke 2.52 says, Jesus increased in what? Wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with man. Then around the age 30, Jesus opened, he uh, opened his door. He went down to the River Jordan and he's anointed with the Holy Spirit, baptized with spirit power and begins his public ministry around the age of 30. Jesus attracted a great deal of public attention in those days. His teachings were unique, fresh, powerful. No man ever spoke like this man spoke, they said. Thousands followed him and they listened with rapt attention. He was also a man of mighty works and deeds. His fame began to spread across the countryside. Large crowds of people thronged to see him, the great teacher from heaven. But his ministry excited the anger of religious leaders. And soon many devout people were on the wrong side of the great controversy. And then the popular opinion began to turn against him. When they realized he was not going to become the kind of king that they had, had envisioned. Thus Christ's ministry was cut short and he was swept to his death. The gospels devote about a third of their content to the final week of Christ's ministry on earth, that week just before he's crucified, about a third. There are several aspects of Christ's life that, that uh, underscored his unique greatness. Number one, he is the Messiah. What does that word mean? It means the anointed one. He is the Messiah, the Christ. He is presented as God's Messiah. Interesting reference to that in Daniel 9, verse 25, that wonderful prophecy. You know, the time prophecies of Daniel are so extremely important. In uh, Daniel 9, 25, the prediction is made of the very year that he would go to the River Jordan to be baptized and anointed with the Holy Spirit. He's called in that passage, Messiah the Prince. The time prophecies prescribed the very year that Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan and give us great confidence in the accuracy of these prophecies in Daniel. The prophecies of Daniel are unique. They reach clear down to our time. Aren't you glad? We have instruction in the book of Daniel for ourselves to be ready for Jesus to come. And these prophecies, the ones that have been fulfilled, have been fulfilled to the letter. Amen. We can have great confidence in Scripture. It's one book written by 40 different authors over a 1,500-year period. 66 books. Ideally, the Bible is a library, a divine library, a inspired library. He was God's Messiah, but he's our Savior and our Lord. There were popular expectations of the Messiah in the Old Testament. First of all, the Jews expected him to be the son of David. And Jesus was that royal son. Isaiah 9, verse 7. Let's, let's look at it. This is a powerful text. Isaiah verse 9, chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. These verses really mirror Handel's Messiah. They're taken from this. A, a Christmas song that was uh, written many years ago. Let's look at it. Chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. Wonderful promise to us. For unto us a child is, give, is born. To us a son is given. To who? To us. Human family, humanity. He did this in order to save a, a whole world of sinners. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, 
the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon, the king, upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice from hereafter, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. There are numerous texts in the Old Testament that talk about him being the heir to David's throne, the son of David. And also that he would be Daniel's son of man. You know, Jesus just loved to talk about himself as a son of man. He mentioned it often. Son of man? He's one of us. That's what he said. That's what he meant. The son of man in Daniel who comes with the clouds of heaven to receive a kingdom in the judgment. In Daniel chapter 7. This is huge. Jesus often referred to himself as the son of man. He was truly... He has truly identified himself with us. I'm so glad about that. That gives me hope every day. And uh, there was, how, however, another Old Testament expectation as they read the Old Testament. It's found in Isaiah chapters 45 through 53, those several chapters in Isaiah. Here he is, he's declared to be the suffering servant. There on David's throne, yes, power and glory, all those things, son of man. But Isaiah depicts him as the suffering servant. I, I think we'll turn, turn to it. I don't know how much time we have this morning. Do we have till 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock? <laughs> <laughs> Isaiah chapter 53. We're all familiar with these. The suffering servant. This was not very well understood nor received by the people in his time when he came. You remember what the Bible says? He came to his own and what? His own received him not. Isaiah chapter 53, let's read a few verses here. Uh, makes it three to five. Isaiah 53, three to five. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for, you might put your own name in there. My name is Alvin. He was wounded for Alvin's transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. He was beaten clear to the bone. The Roman whip went all the way to the bone. Strong men wielded those, those things, and Jesus felt, and the blood ran down his back as he was smitten. He was smitten for who? For us. I almost feel like I'm standing on holy ground as I read these things. The New Testament proclaims that he is that suffering servant. This took the Jews by surprise because no Jewish teacher had ever made such a connection between the suffering servant and the Messiah. In Matthew 16, even the disciples were unable to accept this at first. They could associate the Son of Man with glory and honor and dominion, a conquering hero, but not with shame and suffering. Jesus was indeed iniquity for us and uniquely a great teacher he was the new Moses the new Torah you know in John it says that he is the word the Torah first five books of the Bible can you imagine how the Jewish leaders the rabbis felt when they when they, they, they when he took the when he said that the revered Torah the first five books of Moses and Jesus said I'm the word they use that word, word, to depict Jesus, what he was. And here Jesus claims to be that. Oh, it brought terrible, terrible uh, uh, problems in their mind. The Gospels contain at least eight major, major discourses that remind us of the first five books of the Bible, the Torah. Number one, the Sermon on the Mount. Find that in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. 
If you have a Bible with a red letter edition, there's three chapters in a row that are all the words in, are in red, the words of Jesus. Sermon on the Mount, it portrays with clarity the law of Christ's new kingdom and penetrates even to the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Secondly, John describes the Last Supper that is reminiscent of the great covenantal renewal recorded in Deuteronomy. Thirdly, Christ's farewell discourse resembles Moses' farewell as Moses repeated the law of Christ at his death uh, before he goes up on Mount Nebo and dies. And uh, fourthly, the obligations imposed upon the covenantal people are faith in Jesus and love for one another. Really, that is a summary of the law, right? In Romans 13, it talks about love is the fulfilling of the law. He mentions some of the commandments there in that passage in, in Romans 13. Fifthly, henceforth, love would be the sign of discipleship. Love is the opposite of selfishness. If we were to have a board here and we'd write selfishness, under the general heading of selfishness comes what? Every other sin, every sin that you can think of, comes under the general heading of selfishness. Uh, henceforth, love would be the sign of discipleship. This much of the teaching of Jesus is not new. It's essentially Old Testament packaged in new light. For the Old Testament pointed forward to him. When the rabbis taught with authority, they often quoted some other authority, right? I'm reading from Moses, okay? They would quote the authority. Even the Old Testament prophets, they, they began their discourses often with, thus saith the Lord, right? But when Jesus talked, it was with his own authority. They realized that he was teaching with authority, right? Indeed, when Jesus spoke, it was the Lord himself the one who had inspired all of the prophets of old. And when the Pharisees said, we believe Moses, Moses is our leader. Can you imagine the thoughts that went through Jesus' mind as they said these things, when really he's the one who, who brought Moses back to the promised land with a whole bunch of people. And when they said these things, the angels who know all about this, they must have been in great wonderment. The very one who called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees refused to believe who he was. Much of the confusion in our present world is about the same idea. Who is Jesus? That's one of the best kept secrets in all the world today. Who is Jesus? The teachings of Jesus are also unique because of their spirituality. He did not repudiate the essential truth of the law as some do today, but he magnified it. Isaiah 42 says he magnified the law and made it what? Honorable. Love is the fulfilling of the law. He wants to see that in his people. He wants to see the law written in our hearts so that we love one another. This church will be successful in its mission only to the extent that this principle is found in our hearts. He cut through all the external issues to the heart of the matter. He penetrated the religious system of Judaism with all of its man-made laws and traditions and separated between the essential and the non-essential. He showed that religion, religion can be burdened with externals and yet, and yet be blinded to the real relationship that all must have with God on a personal level. Personal level. Jesus taught that the real aim of the law was not to impress people with how good we are, with our law keeping in other words, but rather to promote faith and justice and love and mercy. Well, do you know the people of God today should be the foremost exponents of the love of God to the, to the neighborhoods wherever they are? What do you think the preacher should be preaching about in the pulpit today? All the things that are going on in the world, we should be pointing people to Jesus, right? The Lamb of God, which takes away the sin, the cause of all the misery that's in the planet. 
He called these things the weightier matters of the law. Matthew 23, 23. Let's look at that. Matthew 23, 23. Matthew 23, 23. He cut to the chase sometimes when he talked. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you pay tithe and mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment and mercy and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. So that's Jesus, his, his counsel of that first century. The greatness of Christ is also related not only to what he taught, but to his great deeds. All of his things that he did Reveal the Father's love. Reveal to us what God is like. For us, the power of the gospel is revealed not so much in what we say, but in how we live. That was even more so true in Christ's life, his holy life. And the unique greatness of Christ, and this is where he differs from Muhammad and Confucius, and some of the other leaders of the great religions of the world, he differed primarily because of who he is, the Lord from heaven, the creator of the universe, the one who loves everybody with an everlasting love. There never lived a more harmless, undefiled being. He took advantage of no one. The very fact that he came, that the very fact that he said he came to save sinners implies his own conscious um, freedom from the personal guilt. He didn't have guilt. He didn't carry around a load of guilt. The very fact that he came to, said he came to save sinners shows that he did not have guilt. And from all the need of personal salvation, Jesus did, did, Jesus did not need personal salvation. He didn't needs salvation. He was the holy God from heaven. He never stood in any need of conversion or regeneration. He never asked for forgiveness and pardon except on behalf of others. His, his life was always about who? Others who were around him. To re, and to remove all doubt, in John eight forty six, he says, which of you convinces me of sin? Okay. He was not a sinner, was he? He did no wrong, never in a thought or a deed. You know, sin is the great mystery of history. The Bible calls it the mystery of what? Iniquity, the mystery of iniquity. To explain it is to excuse it. Sin is the problem of all problems. It has selfish tentacles that reach into every facet of life. Sin is the fruitful source of all misery and, mo and woe. And the literature of all the nations is full of lament of the awful result of sin. Even heathen poets, philosophers, historians, they acknowledge it. There is not any of us or anyone who has ever lived here on the planet who has not had the need to change some destructive folly or defect in our innermost life. We all have that problem, don't we? Romans 3, verse 10 says, There is none righteous. What does it say next? No, not one. Yeah. The Bible says that all our righteousnesses are as what? Who wrote that? Do you know the name of the man? It was the holy prophet Isaiah. <laughs> as he sees this vision in Isaiah chapter 6, he's totally undone as he sees himself, as he sees himself before the king the king of the universe. And so we are all like an unclean thing. And our unworthiness deepens the more we think about it. With every advanced step, our repentance will deepen. There's not a single saint who has ever lived who is not in need of the new birth. Where the old man of sin is crucified in Christ and a new creature emerges. Not one, except who? 
Jesus. In Jesus, we see a man, the God-man. He thinks like a man. He has feelings like a person. He's tempted like a person. He speaks and acts and suffers and dies like a person. And in, the, and, and in every way, he was a man as a man was meant to be. He was a man as a man was meant to be. Now, when Adam was first created, he was a man as a man was meant to be, right? He was created in God's image, right? And he was perfect in his ways, ready to develop and to, and to grow, okay? But Jesus came here, a man as a man was meant to be. And everywhere around him were sinners in every direction. Can you imagine that, being thrown into that? Adam, the first Adam, wasn't in that kind of a situation, right? He wasn't surrounded with a world of sinners. He was surrounded with the beauties of Eden, no less than that, and the Lord himself. But Jesus was surrounded by sinners in every direction, every direction of the compass, a man with the keenest sensitivity to sin and the deep sympathy for sinners. Yet, never touched in the least by the contamination of the world. That is, until he hangs on the cross from Gethsemane onward, he took all of our sins. He was considered us. What an idea. That's Jesus. The astounding fact of all history is that a sin sinless Savior was surrounded by a sinful world. And uh, Jesus was truly human. All that man was meant to be in fellowship with God and also with man. There have been great men and saints of history, people who were noted for their wonderful characters. But one of them may be just, right? Might be your neighbor, just. Yes, but on the other hand, severe and lacking in compassion. And another might be compassionate, yet lacking in, in strict adherence to truth. But Jesus was not that way. How was it with Jesus? He carried out his perfect doctrine in his life and in his conduct. He that drove the money changers from the temple blessed the little children, healed lepers, rescued a sinking disciple on this troubled sea. What is the importance of all these facets of the miraculous life that, Jesus, that is Jesus? In talking about his matchless life, we do not diminish his, diminish his death on the cross. We really highlight his substitutionary death in our place when we realize what kind of a life was given up, a life perfect, a perfect life that was perfectly full of love and compassion for all. That's the kind of a life that was sacrificed, that died on the cross on our behalf. A lamb without what? Spot or blemish. Acts 1.11 talks about him going back to heaven. And it says, this same Jesus. What Jesus? This same Jesus that we've been talking about went back to heaven. And he will come again. We must be careful here. We're talking about the historic Jesus Christ it's not the Jesus of our imagination or some mystical being with a mystical, mystical experience. It's, it is the Jesus of Nazareth, the same Jesus that was with the disciples for three and a half years. Uh, the only way to know him is through the holy history of the Bible. Let me ask you a question. How much would we know about Jesus if it wasn't for our Bible? Nothing, very little. Nature's even kind of messed up, isn't it? As you, as, you think, as you think what's going on and the nature of humans. It's this same man, Jesus Christ, who will come in power and glory. The Lord himself, it says in the first Thessalonians 4, 16. Let me ask you again, how much would we know about him or know him without the scripture. 
You think it's important for us to spend some quality time every day searching the Word? The whole Word is about Him. We learn to know Him, not just about Him, but as we read the Scripture and pray for the Holy Spirit to make this meaningful to us, we become a part of what the Bible has to offer. To know Jesus is to know the Father. And therefore, we look to the life of Jesus and realize we are viewing the very character of God, not a God, but the God of heaven. The very character of God, the very God, a part of the Godhead. Colossians 2.9 says that for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the what? Godhead bodily. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen what? What did he mean by that? Does it mean that they're the same person? No. no, he's talking about the character of God. The character of the Father was seen in Jesus. He was a perfect representative of the Godhead on earth in our organism. Most of what we can know about God is revealed in Christ's life. Finally, but not least, Christ's life has redemptive significance. We're talking about a lot of things now. But Christ's life has redemptive significance. Let, me, let us turn to a, a passage in the Bible that is uh, one of the precious words of Apostle Paul. Romans chapter 5, 8, 9, and 10. He pretty well summarizes here what we've been talking about. Romans chapter 5, verses 8, 9, and 10. says, but God commends his love toward us in that why we were yet what? Amen. Sinners. Or one translation says enemies. Christ died for us. Much more then, being, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And verse 10, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. We've talked a little bit about that life this morning. And uh, we don't want to diminish that because Christ is our what? Righteousness. What is real righteousness? It's, it's a perfect law keeping, right? From the heart, the thoughts and the motives, all those things combined. That's what Jesus was. And Christ is my righteousness and justification. So it's not only in his death, but the gospel embraces also that, that birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. Now that victorious life is the birthright of every believer. Amen. And when we give our hearts to Jesus, he looks at us as though we had lived like he lived and spoke as he spoke. We don't need to worry about what the Father thinks about us, but what he thinks about Christ, our what? Our substitute. In the Bible, we have an Old Testament and a New Testament, right? That could be said an Old Covenant and a New Covenant. We call the Old Testament the Old History, the Old Testament. It's the history of the fall of Adam and all of his descendants. As you read through the Old Testament, you see a lot of things there, don't you? It's the history of the old man. The old man of the old history is Adam. We all fell in him. If we could, while we're still in, in Romans chapter 5, let's look at a couple of verses near the end of the chapter. Verse 19, or let's, 18 and 19. Romans 5, 18 and 19. Therefore, as by the offense of one, who is that one? That's Adam. Adam. Okay, by the offense of one, judgment came upon on all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one. And in my Bible, it's capital O. Who's that? Jesus. Jesus. By the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. 
Wow, what, that's, that is really a, a mouthful. Adam means mankind. He embraces us all. We are all linked to the history of the Old Testament as we're born into this world. The Old Testament is a history of me and all of my failures and shortcomings. We can look at those Old Testament characters and we say, well, if we'd been there, we wouldn't have been like that, right? No. It's the story of people who are just like us and with all their shortcomings and failures. Therefore, we read the Old Testament. When we read it, we should see it as a reflection of us. The Old Testament is the history of man, whose name is Adam. It is the history of Israel. Everything was lost in that Adam. And even at its best, the history of the Old Testament Israel fell far short of the mark. That history stands under the justice of God. And uh, the result of that history of the Old Testament spelled the, a very bad situation for the Jewish, as a, Jews as a nation. Matthew chapter 21, let's look at it. Matthew 21, 22, and 23 are the last conversations that we have recorded of uh, Christ's conversations with the Jewish leaders. Matthew 21, verse 43. If you have it, say amen. amen. We're about done here. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God shall be what? Does it say? Taken from you. And given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Who is that nation? We are the Christian church. It doesn't mean the Jews are rejected. It means that, that we have the same footing that they've had now, Right? As a nation, they were to carry the gospel to the world, but they didn't do that, did they? Instead, we have their history in the Old Testament. And finally, when it comes down to the final days, Jesus was rejected, rejected by them. Crucify him, crucify him, they said. That's us. What a history. <clears throat> that history stands under the justice of God. But in the holy history of Jesus Christ... We as humans have a new history. That is the New Testament. It tells us how, how, we can, how we can be a part of that heavenly family. This new history begins with Jesus. New Testament here, right? In 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus is called the last Adam. We could call him the, the uh, new Adam or the second Adam. Now, in Isaiah 9, verse 6, you remember we read, it says that unto us is a, is, a, is a son born. His name shall be called Wonderful. Everlasting Father. He's a new father for the human family. We have a new Adam now in who's a new race of people. And we can choose to be a part of that family every day. We die to the old. It's called new birth in the New Testament. We have that wonderful privilege. Everyone is going to be new. The new Adam, the second Adam. Matthew tells the history of Jesus tempted in the wilderness for 40 days. Isn't that right? What a temptation. When Israel fell, failed for 40 years in the wilderness, Jesus passed over that same ground and he succeeded and he's victorious. And that's ours by faith. He's the new Adam. We can become a part of that new family. In Christ's life, we have a new history for humanity. In the life of Christ, God rewrites the history of the world as it was meant to be. Jesus is the new Israel. What does Israel mean, by the way? Overcomer. He is the new Israel. <laughs> See how he overcomes. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 to 9. Hebrews 5, verses 7 to 9. And we're almost done here. I said that before, didn't I? <laughs> Hebrews 5, verses 7 to 9. It says, Who in the days of his flesh, talking about Jesus here, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears to him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, capital S, yet he learned obedience by the things with which he suffered. 
And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. The new Adam, the second Adam. And when we accept Jesus as Savior and Lord, he takes away the old history and gives us a new one. Take a look at the life of Christ. We've been talking about that this morning. That becomes our history. A new history. He looks at us as though we had never sinned. His holy history lived out in our organism for 33 years. We call it the righteousness of Christ. This is the name by which they will be called. Talking about us. The Lord, our righteousness. He looks at such justified believers just as he looks at his own son. And when we realize that his history is perfect and contains the righteousness of faith for every believer, we are awed. I'm awed as I think of what he's done. And we are drawn to repentance by the grace of God. In fact, the fact that we have been identified with the old history is cause for repentance. That's how we're all found in the world. In fact, every morning we need to do that. In fact, the message to Laodicea is repent. But that's, that's something we do. That's godly sorrow. The old history. We're sorry for the old history. It causes us to cry out every day, Oh, wretched man that I am! Who will deliver me from this body of death? And guess what? The next verse says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. When we hear the gospel of the sinless, perfect Savior, it causes us to identify with him as our new spiritual father, our new history. We have a new history. We can have that even now. In fact, the Bible says we can dwell with him in heavenly places. Now, that's Ephesians 2, verse 6. And wonder of wonders, we're invited to be part of that new history by way of, the, by way of birth, born again, a new race of people, Yes, Jesus is wonderful. He is counselor. Can we take counsel from him every day as we study his word? He's counselor. He's very close to us. Jesus is the mighty God. He's our new father, the second Adam. Jesus is the prince of peace. He is Messiah, the prince. Jesus is our Savior. He's the suffering servant. He had a lifetime of cross-bearing on our behalf. As we get into a new week, let's pray for a new and renewed faith in Him. I want to read a verse from Acts 2, verse 38, while we're all standing here. It says, Peter said to them, this is in his Pentecostal sermon on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 were baptized that day. Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for their mission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. There may be some here this morning who have not given yourself to Jesus in a meaningful way. I want to appeal to you this morning. Consider that. I want to appeal to you to give your heart to Jesus in a meaningful way. And uh, if some of you perhaps would look forward to baptism, we would be more than happy to receive you on that basis. Uh, we'll make a provision for that. So uh, please give, consider him who died for us and what that can mean to all of us. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, this morning we lift our, our voices in thanksgiving and praise to you who has done so much for us. Please bring, please bring conviction to our hearts and to our minds that you have, that you are wanting to receive us to yourself. Please make each one of us ready for that day when Jesus comes. And I pray that you will be with each one today according to our several needs. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.